<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Amsterdam Center for International Law, the International Criminal Court versus Powerful States, uh, the UK Iraq Preliminary Examination, and beyond. Um, my name is Priya Urs. I'm a doctoral student at University College London, and I'll be moderating today's uh, very interesting panel. Um, so the starting point for the discussion is the prosecutor's decision of 9th December 2020 not to investigate alleged British uh, war crimes committed in Iraq. Um, that decision turned on the principle of complementarity, which is relevant uh, in other contexts implicating uh, powerful states as well. So in particular, with respect to alleged US crimes in respect to the situation in Afghanistan, as well as alleged uh, Israeli crimes in respect of the situation in Palestine. Um, two more developments at the court make the discussion even more timely. Uh, the first, of course, being the pretrial chamber's recent decision confirming the jurisdiction of the court over the situation in Palestine. And uh, the second being the appointment of Karim Khan of the UK as the next uh, prosecutor of the court. Uh, so there's plenty to be discussed. Um, a quick note on the structure of the panel. So each speaker will talk for about 12 to 15 minutes, uh, which leaves us plenty of time for discussion and for questions. Um, please uh, send over your questions using the chat function and feel free to do, to, to do so as and when uh, they occur to you. I think uh, we had about 300 people registered for the event, uh, but attendance is also still quite high. So I expect there will be um, many questions and hopefully we'll be able to address them all. Um, I'll now briefly introduce our speakers in the order in which uh, they will speak. Uh, first, we have Carla Firstman, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Law at the University of Essex and who has worked extensively in the field of human rights. Um, next, we have Patrick Labuda, who is responsible for putting together this wonderful event um, and who is a postdoctoral visiting fellow at the Amsterdam Center for International Law at the UVA. Finally, we have Yali uh, Sheroshevsky, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Cybersecurity Center at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and who will be joining the University of Haifa uh, Law School as an associate professor this fall. Um, so I will now hand over to Carla, who will kick off the discussion with um, a focus on the report in respect, especially of uh, the UK, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. And it's really a great pleasure to be here. It's an honor. Um, what I thought I would do in looking at the report is actually to look a little bit backward, um, given that the report focuses on issues related to complementarity, I thought it would be interesting to focus most of my comments on uh, what has been happening in the United Kingdom in relation to investigations to then be able to consider that in light of what the Office of the Prosecutor has set out in the report on, on um, preliminary examinations, closing down the preliminary examination. Um, so firstly, to start with the allegations themselves, the allegations concern um, the, U the UK's um, involvement uh, in Iraq as part of the coalition provisional authority in 2003-2004, and the allegations concern issues around mis mistreatments, including um, torture of detainees, um, some battle type killings, and the use of the five techniques uh, that had been banned ever since Ireland versus the UK. So the interrogation techniques uh, that together had been um, considered as part of that decision and formally banned in the United Kingdom. Um, so when looking to the UK's response to these allegations, um, firstly, it's important to note that at the outset, so in 2003, 2004, that type of period, when uh, the allegations started to come out, the initial response of the UK government was that these are um, incidents which relate uh, to events in Iraq and our obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights do not extend extraterritorially. 
in respect of investigations under Articles 2 and 3 of the Convention. So that was the initial position which was ultimately challenged um, before the European Court of Human Rights, the U European Court coming back and saying, well, well actually, no, um, you do have extraterritorial obligations in relation to certain things, um, including, for instance, in the context of detention. Um, so that uh, led to quite obvious delays in the starting of European Convention compliant investigations. And you had a number of incidents which arose, um, one of which was, is probably most famous, which is the uh, killing, um, the death and detention of Baha Musa, who was an Iraqi civilian hotel receptionist who was found with 93 different wounds um, on his body. Um, and the, there was a court martial which resulted in one, um, uh, one person pled guilty, uh, a junior uh, official, um, a junior officer, and the rest being found uh, not guilty. And in the subsequent um, consideration of this court martial, the, it, was, it was determined that the Ministry of Defense's chain of command failed to address a more or less obvious closing of the ranks. Uh, subsequent to this, many claims were filed. Um, these were progressing mainly given the UK legal system through civil courts, but also given the continued need to address the failure to investigate following the European court's involvement, um, there was a need to set up a new structure for investigations. And the Iraq historical allegations team was set up to be a pretty focused um, quasi-military, quasi-independent structure to investigate wide-scale allegations related to abuses taking place in Iraq. Um, that was continuing, but there was a subsequent inquiry relating to a particular incident in Iraq, which concluded in 2014, this is the al Swedian inquiry, and it was ultimately determined that the, in, the allegations relating to this al Swedian inquiry were mainly untrue. Questions about how or when the solicitors knew that the allegations were untrue um, surfaced. And this issue eventually led to the Ministry of Defense bringing uh, claims of solicitors' misconduct against a number of the firms who had been involved in the allegations. Um, in a way, this incident um, was like a pot of gold for the, the Ministry of Defense in the sense that it was turned into a media campaign about uh, the lawyers, the ambulance, ambulance chasing lawyers versus the, um, the, uh, blame, uh, the blameless uh, troops. So it was turned into a very black and white debate about where efforts should be um, considered and nowhere in that equation was there any more a consideration of Iraqi civilian victims. It got to the point in terms of the public debate on issues around accountability that both the prime minister, the minister of defense were talking openly about ongoing proceedings um, talking about the vexatious claims that had been brought. So talking against the proceedings whilst they were still going on, which is obviously a challenge for their independence in terms of the independence of the process. Um, the Iraq historical allegations team work continued, but it was marred by this political process, the media campaigns against it, and also the perception that the cases were being kept on to appease the International Criminal Court. And all of this had an, a negative uh, tarnish on the process, even though a number of the investigations um, were carried out very, very thoroughly. And um, eventually, um, one of the law firms that had been involved um, 
uh, had brought claims to the International Criminal Court. A preliminary examination was opened, as you know, and then it was initially closed because there, it was seen that it wasn't sufficiently grave. That was then reopened after more claims were um, introduced. So looking to the United Kingdom's response to the ICC's engagement, um, I think here it's really important to note that the United Kingdom is a supporter of the International Criminal Court. So it's quite a different kind of response than what we would or what we have indeed seen with respect to the United States in relation to allegations of uh, US uh, in involvement in, in crimes committed in Afghanistan. Uh, it's a much more nuanced uh, response. So on, on the surface um, and in general, there, there, there has been great support from the United Kingdom, um, answering questions, providing information to the Office of the Prosecutor and generally be, being available to, to, to answer questions. Um, looking a little bit more closely, though, the type of advocacy that was taken up by the uh, UK government was focused uh, to, to a large degree in terms of efficiencies, uh, the importance of shortening and putting clear time limits on preliminary examinations. One could say that this was a general concern and generally a good thing, but one could also possibly uh, wonder whether this had anything to do with the Open, open in examination in relation to its case. Back home uh, in the United Kingdom, the focus was on this IHAT, Iraq Historical Allegations Team investigation, and the need to show that the ICC preliminary examination was moot because uh, things were happening back home. Uh, but in a way, the demonization of the lawyers was part of a much wider attack on public interest advocacy in the United Kingdom. Um, but in relation to the narrow Iraq claims, it was to show essentially, as I've already said, that these were ambulance chasers and the facts uh, showing impropriety of the lawyers was a, a way of attacking the evidence itself. So the idea was to lessen the legitimacy of the lawyers and in so doing the claims themselves. And in fact, ultimately many of the allegations were ultimately closed by this IHAT team in large part because they were submitted by some of these lawyers. Um, there was the hope that the ICC would also take a similar view. So to close the cases because the reputation of the lawyers bringing them had been so successfully tarnished. The ICC, I would say, successfully resisted that and never made a, a clear correlation um, between the, the, these issues. Um, a second attack which came up was um, the Overseas Operations Veteran Protection Bill, which is in the final stages of um, parliamentary debate right now. And essentially, it's uh, to provide closure for the troops and to prevent investigations and reinvestigation. So the main aspects of this bill are that prosecutions need to take place within five years of the offense, unless there are exceptional circumstances. So there's a presumption against prosecutions, which relate to incidents which uh, are more than five years old. There's an except, exception for sexual offenses, but there is no exception for war crimes, genocide, or crimes against humanity, though that is part of the debate before the parliament. There's also uh, an aspect of tightening up limitation for civil actions, so judges will no longer have the discretion to increase the time frame to bring civil claims. There's a fixed time period in which they can be brought which is limited, and that's it. And there's also, uh, as part of this bill, a duty on the government to consider derogating from the European Convention on Human Rights any time there is a future overseas deployment of troops. So quite, um, quite interesting. And it will not be surprising that the point has been made by many that the introduction of a presumption against prosecution 
can give rise to questions about the UK's ability and willingness to genuinely investigate and prosecute these or future crimes should they come to light. In the Office of the Prosecutor's final report on uh, the preliminary examination in relation to Iraq, UK, the OTP specifies that there's a reasonable basis to believe that various forms of abuse were committed by members of UK armed forces against Iraqi civilians in detention. So there's not debate at this stage. In a way, the evidentiary hurdle has been met, according to the Office of the Prosecutor. But on complementarity, the Office of the Prosecutor states the outcome of the more than 10 year long domestic process involving the examination of thousands of allegations has resulted in not one single case being submitted for prosecution, a result that has deprived the victims of justice. That's a very strong statement. Um, but following that statement, the Office of the Prosecutor states, but remember, we are not a human rights court. And the test that we're applying is we simply must consider whether on the facts, on their face, these facts demonstrate an intent to shield persons from criminal responsibility. So what is our, how can we take the, this? Um, uh, my view on, 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 on that is that the timing is just simply unfortunate. It's unfortunate because in many ways, the closure of the preliminary examination has emboldened uh, elements within the UK government uh, with respect to this anti-accountability bill. In a way, uh, once the ICC examination was closed, it was really a green light for the bill. Uh, even though one can, uh, one can argue, well, the preliminary examination was looking at a different set of crimes, it wouldn't necessarily uh, relate to future crimes, nevertheless, the message was, was that. Um, I, one can dispute that argument. Um, with respect to the test, should the OTP have adopted a wider test than simply, is there an intent to shield persons from criminal responsibility? Here, I would say absolutely yes. And I would also say that with respect to the statements that we're not a human rights court, Certainly the uh, International Criminal Court is not a human rights court, but at the stage of the preliminary examination, I think it would be um, untrue to state that there's no correlation between what is an effective investigation under international human rights law and the test before um, with respect to complementarity at the preliminary examination stage before there's an individual who's been put into the sphere as a potential accused person. Remember, we're at the stage of the situation. No individual has been named. And as a result, it's perfectly appropriate to consider the issue in its context, within the context of the overall situation, and looking at uh, broad figures, broad trends um, would be um, important. So it's a missed opportunity in that respect. So perhaps I'll stop there and sorry for going over a little bit my time. Thought I would go under. Oh no, you didn't go over at all. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, but thank you. Uh, that was a really comprehensive account, I think, especially of like, the climate in which these various developments uh, have taken place, uh, including within the UK, um, which is quite interesting to note. Um, and also the approach that you suggest to complementarity at the situation stage, perhaps being uh, different from how we understand complementarity at, at the case stage once we actually know um, what the case is. Um, so this is a good point for me to hand over to Patrick, who will go into a bit more detail um, as to the prosecutor's approach to complementarity um, in this particular report, but also the implications um, for other assessments in the future in other contexts. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Priya. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, if, 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 does everybody see my PowerPoint? Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, just one point of uh, order, I guess. Um, if you have questions, I think you, you have to type them in the chat. Um, I, I, we, I don't think we have the option of unmuting you and letting you speak. So um, if you have a question, you, you, you type it in the chat and 
Uh, we'll read it out later and, and we'll try and um, respond. Um, okay, so, and yeah, I mean, it's also great to see so many people, uh, familiar names in the, in the chat. Um, you know, in, in this presentation, I'm or in, in my talk, I'm just going to try and dig a little deeper and, and and focus really on the on the legal stuff, right? So, um, the complementarity test uh, specifically, and and you know, I'm going to begin by by uh, by making one disclaimer uh, in that you know, I don't I don't really have a strong opinion about the UK's domestic response. Um, what I'm focusing on really is uh, sort of the OTP's legal analysis. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to take at face value what they say in this report, and then uh, you know I want to basically explore uh, what that might mean for complementarity um, in uh, other other countries. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn to the OTP's complementarity analysis. Uh, sorry, I have a fly flying around here. Um, so I, uh, briefly, for those who you know aren't familiar or don't remember, you know, complementarity is a two-step test. So the first question is whether the state is active, and only if uh, the answer to that question is positive, do you move to the next step, which is um, the unwilling or unable test, right? And this is important. So, you know, the first thing that the prosecutor had to look at is whether the UK um, was investigating and prosecuting um, people at all. And only if the answer to that question is yes, do you move to really this question of unwillingness and inability? Um, and of course, you know, we could we could talk about Article 17, you know, here you have the three limbs of Article 17, the unwilling test, uh, the shielding, unjustified delay, and independence and impartiality. And I mean, we could talk about this for a long time, but I, but I really want to, you know, focus on what's, what's in the report and what it tells us about complementarity more generally. Um, and so, you know, the first point that I want to make uh, is about inactivity and how it relates to uh, command responsibility. Uh, Carla said this a moment ago, according to the prosecutor, uh, and this is in the report, you know, after 10 years, uh, the UK has prosecuted zero uh, cases from Iraq. Uh, and, you know, that naturally raises the question, okay, so was the UK active at all? I mean, what is it, what was it doing for the past 10 years? And I think the report explains pretty persuasively why uh, the UK was not inactive. Uh, you know, it talks about its many investigations and, and all of this is more or less persuasive. Um, but one thing that, you know, that, that is really surprising uh, is how the OTP handles uh, the problem of command responsibility. Um, you know, the, the, so the prosecutor again first examines whether the UK has investigated those most responsible, then, and if she determines that yes, the UK has conducted investigations implicating, you know, uh, people who could be considered most responsible. Uh, she has to ask whether those investigations were um, designed to shield those most responsible for from um, criminal responsibility. And you know, th there's a lot in this report, so it's easy to miss this. But but I I didn't really find anything of substance about the UK's investigations, let alone prosecutions of former ministers of defense. Uh, you know, high-ranking army commanders. I mean, it, it's it's not in the report, right? And in a way, it makes sense. the The UK wasn't able to build a single prosecutable case against its foot soldiers. So how how do you build a case against you know the commander? Um, there, there, it, it's 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 a complicated question, right? And it really goes to you know. Complicated questions of, of international criminal law and also the relationship, I think, between inactivity and uh, unwillingness in the complementarity test. But but I want to flag just this excerpt from the report. 
The prosecutor has found several levels of institutional uh, civilian super supervisory and military command failures that contributed to the commission of crimes against detainees by UK so soldiers. Uh, the conclusion of, of all this is, is of extreme gravity, right? Um, sorry, I can't see on my screen, but um, yeah, and the, the paucity of cases concerning command responsibility cannot in and of itself provide a basis for the prosecutor to argue that the UK authorities have sought to shield. So they're saying that the paucity of cases is not in, in and of itself evidence. And you know, my answer to that or my response is really, why not? You know, why isn't this enough actually? I mean, if, if the UK has not prosecuted or investigated high level commanders, then, you know, if the prosecutor really wanted to, she could have opened an investigation just based on this, right? Because they haven't met the inactivity um, prong of the complementarity test. Um, and if you look at the prosecutor's report, you'll see that, you know, it's very vague, it's very brief. It's very vague when it comes to, to this question. And, and there's not really a satisfactory, I think, answer in the report. Um, okay, so after um, inactivity, I, I wanna turn to unwillingness, right? And, and this is at the heart of the decision. Um, you know, my main criticism is that after reading this decision, I just don't know what is the OTP's legal standard for unwilling genuinely to prosecute. I don't, I still don't know what it means for a state to shield perpetrators from justice. And that's because, you know, the prosecutor never really tells us what the legal standard is. Uh, instead, what she does repeatedly in this report is tell us what the legal standard is not. And, and this is a fundamental distinction. Uh, um, and, and let me explain what I mean by this. So, so the, the case law on complementarity so far has not said much about unwillingness. Um, but the prosecutor turns to the appeals chamber, the Al Sanusi case from 2014, and she focuses on this. So the ICC was not established to be an international court of human rights sitting in judgment over domestic legal systems um, to ensure that they are compliant with international standards of human rights. Um, and this is this distinction between the ICC, a criminal court, and uh, human, uh, human rights courts is, is, is fundamental for this decision. But it's really unpersuasive on multiple levels. Um, and let me explain why. I mean, the, first of all, the context of the Sanusi decision is completely different. Uh, there, the state, Libya, wanted to prosecute. And human rights were used as an argument to prevent the state from prosecuting. In the UK situation, the state, the UK, has not prosecuted and human rights are being used to establish why it did not prosecute, whether there has been shielding. Uh, so, you know, the human rights argument in both cases is fundamentally different, right? In Libya, human rights would be used to override Libya's willingness to prosecute, whereas in the UK case, human rights are being used to substantiate the UK's unwillingness. And you know, the prosecutor pretends not to see this fundamental difference uh, and it really contaminates the entire uh, decision. So for those of you uh, who haven't read the decision, I mean, it's basically 100 pages of questionable behavior on the part of the UK authorities who dismiss you know, allegations of crimes, don't initiate prosecutions, et cetera. Um, and the prosecutor goes through all these facts and notes repeatedly where the UK fell short of its due process obligations under uh, human rights law. But she concludes really time and again, and, and again, I'm gonna quote snippets here, that it is not sufficient for the office to have concerns. The primary task of the office is not to express its view on how it might have proceeded. Uh, it is not the office's mandate to pronounce on whether a state complied with human rights. Not, not, not. It keeps telling us what the prosecutor's job is not. But, you know, when, as you're going through this decision, you, you, you suddenly start asking yourself, okay, so what is your job? If that's not your job, then, then what exactly is your job? 
And you know, the, the funny thing is that you're not going to find a legal te uh, test in this decision. Um, the closest you'll come is, is, you know, when the prosecutor says that the Rome statute needs to be read in context, right? And here you have it on this slide again. The correct approach is to examine the totality of the relevant factors in, the, in their context. Now, what does that mean? The problem is that the prosecutor just never tells us at what point sort of isolated investigative shortcomings rise to the threshold of something more systematic, systematic shielding. Uh, you know, when does a pattern of shielding emerge? At what point does political interference from the executive not just slow down an investigation, but, you know, reach the threshold of state sanctioned interference with the entire judicial process? You know, these are very difficult questions, but Essentially, what I think this uh, decision does is to propose a completely unworkable smell test for genuineness and unwillingness, right? Uh, and the closest analogy that I can come up with is sort of the famous uh, UK, uh, sorry, the US Supreme Court um, decision. And you have it here on the screen where, you know, uh, where uh, Justice Potter Stewart says that he can't define what hardcore pornography is, but I know it when I see it. Um, and I think that's what the prosecutor is essentially doing in this case. She, she's telling us that she, she can't define unwillingness. She can't define genuineness, but trust me, I know it when I see it, right? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people will point out that, of course, unwillingness is an inherently subjective concept. And there is some truth to that. Um, what's disturbing about this decision is, is the fact that the prosecutor emphasizes subjective elements all the time and downplays uh, objective evidence that would lend itself, I think, to a more fact-based assessment of the UK's genuineness. Um, and, you know, I, I really walked away from this decision feeling like the prosecutor misses the forest for the trees. She focuses on sort of, you know, isolated issues. She quotes, for example, her conversations with high-ranking judicial officials uh, from the UK and, and explains that their explanations of what happened in the UK are generally reasonable. Generally reasonable is the word that's, that's used. But she ignores or downplays sort of the objective evidence of the UK's, the, the system, how the system seems to be shielding um, perpetrators from justice. And she focuses really on these um, subjective elements. And I, I think that's it's really uh, problematic. Now, uh, turning to the future, uh, what does this all mean? I mean, what is the prosecutor's declination mean for complementarity in other countries. You know, the strangest thing I think about this uh, decision is that I find it really hard to imagine that the OTP will find as much um, compelling evidence of shielding in other situations. You know, there's so many smoking guns in this preliminary examination, people coming forward to acknowledge political interference, people denouncing their superiors. And the OTP just sort of ignores this and decides at the end of the day to not even request the pretrial chamber um, to, to test you know, the possibility of the UK's unwillingness. And, and this procedural point, I think, is, is probably the most important aspect in a way of this decision. You know, Kevin Heller has pointed out, I think, already on opinion of jurists that the, the OTP seems to have gotten the evidentiary standard spectacularly wrong in this case. Uh, it self imposes a high evidentiary threshold. So it, it's suggesting that it has to have hard evidence of shielding that it can rely upon in court before it even launches an investigation. Whereas the Rome statute, and I, Carla mentioned this a moment ago, the Rome Statute requires just a reasonable basis to believe that the UK engaged in shielding. 
Uh, you know, and I think based on the extensive prima facie evidence of the UK's shielding in this report, I, I just don't see how any reasonable judge could reject an investigation request at this point. And yet, you know, the prosecutor takes it upon herself to not submit her findings to the pretrial chamber. It's, it's, it's strange. And I think, you know, just to wrap up, I think it sends two clear messages to states. Um, first, you know, the prosecutor makes it crystal clear that she would much rather not review states' uh, internal accountability decisions. She repeats this time and again uh, and that, you know, she, she says in the report that, that an, analyzing genuine mis unwillingness is hard. And, and this is true, of course, this is true, um, but I think it's important to really put these things into perspective and acknowledge that the reason we're spending millions of dollars on an international court is that states cannot be trusted to prosecute their own international crimes, their own international crimes. Uh, and, and you know, thankfully states recognize this themselves in 1998, which is why you have the unwilling standard in the Rome Statute. My, my big concern is that the o OTP's approach to unwilling uh, makes this standard basically a dead letter, this limb of complement complementarity a dead letter. You're never gonna find a state unwilling genuinely to prosecute if you continue applying this method. Um, and I, I think there's really a, a, a bit of a philosophical, I'd say disconnect in the uh, office of the prosecutor. Um, you know, th their role, isn't to sanitize states' failures. It's really to bring, um, you know, bring this to, to our attention. And you know, if the pretrial pre chamber, of course, decides not to approve their request to proceed with an investigation, then at least it's the judges who decided. I don't understand why the prosecutor took it upon herself to, to not even test the evidence. Um, and and you know, the second implicit message that just decision sends, of course, is that if you have a gen generally functioning legal system, um, it's very unlikely that the prosecutor is going to find you unwilling genuinely uh, to prosecute. Uh, you know, clearly the prosecutor feels uncomfortable looking, um, sort of testing why it is that your system, which generally is generally functioning, you know, it's, it's okay for regular crimes, why it's not possible to, to, to investigate and prosecute international crimes, you know, these more serious crimes. The, the, the prosecutor seems to be saying that unwillingness is almost like a political science concept and, and us lawyers, we're not able to, to deal with this. And, you know, really the last point that I'm gonna make is that, you know, if I were in the US government, I would really be trying right now to persuade uh, the new president, President Biden, to initiate talks with the Office of the Prosecutor over Afghanistan, because I think there's a pretty big chance that the U US would be found, just like the UK, not unwilling. And, and I think it's important to emphasize, not, not, it's not that the US was willing or the UK is willing to investigate. The standard that the OTP has established is not unwilling. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think this is the correct interpretation of um, the unwilling standard. Um, I don't think this is the object and purpose of the International Criminal Court, but I think that's where we're at today. So thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for that very critical account uh, of the prosecutor's report. Um, I myself hadn't paid as much attention to the inability test, but I thought you made a really excellent point on that. Um, and it does seem as if the unwilling genuinely to investigate or prosecute is also um, somewhat of a dead letter, as you say, if it's going to be construed so flexibly. Um, so I'll, I'll now hand over to Yali, who will take the discussion a step further still um, and look at what the prosecutor's approach uh, in this context means uh, in respect of the investigation in Palestine. Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. And um, in the short time that I have, 
as uh, Priya said, I will focus on the implications of the UK decision on the Palestine situation. And that is a clearly hot topic currently, as uh, she also mentioned regarding to the recent uh, pre-trial chamber decision. However, uh, the decision, the recent decision has very little to do with our discussion today that focuses on complementarity. And therefore I will not address it almost at all. And I want to start with maybe two preliminary points. Uh, the first is about the title of this panel. The, the panel uh, focuses on powerful states. And, and what exactly do we mean here by powerful states? I want to suggest that for the purposes of our discussion here, powerful state means just like a, 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 a similar to the end of Patrick uh, discussion, these are states that can invest many resources in their investigations process. And these states following the a, a, a UK decision are uh, unlikely to face uh, proceedings uh, in the uh, ICC regarding those areas that they investigate uh, uh, crimes or invest much resources in, in investigating crimes. The second preliminary decision is that my discussion is even more narrow than I, than I suggested regarding a, a, the recent decision. And it's limited only to the part of potential crimes that are currently under investigation. So uh, uh, the prosecutor recognized several uh, uh, areas of potential crimes, clearly the, the settlements, the 2014 Gaza conflict and the 2018 uh, uh, events um, near the Gaza border, the demonstrations. And out of all of these events, the only relevant, uh, 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 those who are relevant to our uh, 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 discussion is the conduct of uh, Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces uh, in the 2014 Gaza conflict and in the demonstrations near the Gaza border in 2018. And this is because as Patrick uh, explained, there are two stages, right? The, the uh, active inactive phase and if you, there is a, 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 the state is active, then we turn to the discussion that was a, a done in the UK decision and regarding both the settlements and the potential crimes committed by Hamas and other a, organized armed groups in the 2014 a, conflict, the, the relevant parties are not active and therefore the potential crimes are admissible while regarding the 2014 Gaza conflict and the 2018 demonstrations near the Gaza border, there are currently investigations a, 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 that are conducted by Israel. And here I want to differentiate between two types of uh, potential crimes and address the relevance of the UK decision to these. Areas. The first is specific incidents. Okay, so for example, a soldier that intentionally kills civilians and so on. Here, the a, a relation is, is quite clear. And as a Patrick suggested, and, and I think that this, these are the most a, a, a people who commented on the decision think that it will be extremely difficult if you follow the path of the decision to determine that the case is admissible if there are currently investigations. And in the Israeli case, just like the UK, there are many investigations, but only very few indictments. However, again, if you follow the path of the OTP in the UK report, I think that I, it's very doubtful if these specific incidents will be admissible. It, it's much more complicated regarding general policies or general policies or systemic issues. Here, think about, for example, the policy of uh, house demolitions or, or general targeting uh, 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 positions, or for example, regarding the 2018 uh, uh, Gaza demonstrations, the rules of engagement of the IDF. So it's not a specific soldier that uh, uh, shoots uh, 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 while defying the rules of engagement, or the uh, uh, relevant uh, 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 laws, but the general policy of Israel, whether the policy itself constitutes a war crime. 
And here I recently suggested in, in, in a piece in the JICJ that actually there is an unintended negative effect to complementarity because if we accept the position that states wish to avoid ICC proceedings, then we have a question, how should they act when there is a questionable a general policy? Before the involvement of the ICC, it was possible that a court will determine that this a, a general policy is unlawful. So for example, in 2005, a, 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 the Israeli Supreme Court determined that a, a, a using a, a, um, civilians in order to assist a, 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 the military in certain operations was unlawful. However, facing ICC, potential ICC proceedings, what will this Israeli Supreme Court or any other domestic court in constitutional or administrative cases determine if it faces such situations? So for example, the uh, uh, rules of engagement in near the Gaza border. If we assume, and I think that this is a, a reasonable assumption based on what's going on currently in, in the world, that no investigation will take place regarding the highest uh, level officials of the state, right? The prime minister, the cabinet members, or, or the highest level in the, in the military. Then if the court will determine that this a, a, a policy is unlawful and potentially a war crime, but no criminal proceedings will take place following this, this decision, it will actually incentivize or will a, 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 the prosecutor to determine that the state is inactive regarding this specific position, right? Because the state itself, the court itself determined that it's unlawful. However, no investigation or no proceedings were taking place. However, if the court determines that this policy is legal or, or will qualify it in a bit, but still maintain its legality, then, right, it's much more questionable. It's more difficult for the prosecutor to determine that there is a, a, an inaction. It will have to get into the legal discussion on the substance of the law. And indeed, the Israeli Supreme Court determined a, 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 on several occasions that very, a, 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 questionable policies are legal. For example, near the uh, 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 Gaza border, the rules of engagement were deemed uh, lawful by the Supreme Court in a decision from 2018. And the Supreme Court also determined that house demolitions, for example, are legal, but qualified it a bit. I think that the UK decision demonstrates that this uh, 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 um, such a, 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 um, a behavior by the court, this unintended negative effect of complementarity might work for states that wish to avoid ICC proceedings. And this is uh, uh, based on two uh, aspects of the decision. The first is, and, and, and Patrick uh, referred to it, is the fact that the prosecutor was not that concerned that the highest uh, level of uh, uh, officials and military officers were not part of the investigations and prosecutions in the UK. And the second is that it seems that the prosecutor gave much uh, uh, respect to the uh, English courts when it dealt with uh, several decisions by the, the High Court and, and other uh, institutions, it deferred to their positions regarding what's reasonable, how to allocate uh, prosecutorial uh, resources regarding the notion of proportionality and giving that much respect to functioning legal system or, or, or um, indicates that potentially 
decisions by the Israeli Supreme Court or other domestic courts will be treated similarly despite the criticism that these decisions receive in the international law community. So to conclude uh, 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 um, my thoughts on the implications of the UK decision to the uh, situation in Palestine, it is relevant only to part of the potential cases. It is not relevant to the issue of the settlements or to the contact of Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups during the 2014 Gaza conflict. But it is highly relevant to the conduct of the Israeli Defense Forces in 2014 and 2018. And I suspect that it will be very difficult to determine that uh, cases from these events are admissible if uh, 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 the OTP will follow the path of the UK decision. Thank you very much. Uh, that was exactly on time. <laughs> um, I, I can also endorse uh, Gahli's article in the Journal of International Criminal Justice as adding a really interesting angle to the complementarity discussion uh, so far. Um, we already have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, if the speakers agree, what I might do is maybe group a couple of questions together where they 